January the 27th, 1943. The services of the battery band were called for. There's ten X on the bill, and we'd like you to do a twirl, said the district entertainment officer. He had a very high, effeminate voice. I used to be a countertenor at the Guarden, he said. It must have been well in garden, whispered Edge. That evening, a highly polished staff car called for us. Don't touch it, I cautioned. It's a trap. It's only for our instruments. We're supposed to run alongside. We were driven at speed to a massive French colonial opera house, where at one time massive French colonials sang. The sweating sergeant was awaiting. Ah, he said with obvious relief, I'm Sergeant Hope. Oh, what a good memory you've got, I said. I'm the compere. You are the Royal Artillery Orchestra? Yes, I said. Where's the rest of you? This is all there is of me. I'm, I'm considered complete by the M.O. Oh, we had been expecting a full orchestra. We are full. We just had dinner. That will do, he said, leading us to the wings. On stage, an army PT instructor was doing a series of handstands, leaps and somersaults. The conclusion of each trick was standing to his attention and saluting. You don't salute. We're out we're out on you, cunt, said a voice from the khaki rabble. Sergeant Hope took down details of our act. Name? American. Rank? Gunner. Regiment? I'm sorry, I said. Under the Geneva Convention of 21, all I need to give you is my name, rank and number. Look, son, I had a bloody awful day. I'm at the end of my tether, he said. Save the jokes for the stage. I was told you were a 20-piece regimental orchestra and you were going to play Elgar's Pomp and Circumstances. He walked away holding his head. I think it was falling off. The PT sergeant finished his leaping act and was given a reception that he had never had before or since. He came into the wings, grinning with triumph. I think I'll turn pro after the war, he triumphed. The next time I saw him was 1951. He was a furniture remover in Peckham. Changed your mind, I said. He threw a cupboard at me. The worried compo was now the other side of the curtain saying, Thank you, the next act is, uh, the next is the 19th Battalion, Battalion, Battalion Royal Artillery Dance Band, under its, uh, con conductor Gunner Spine Millington. Behind the curtains, we were rupturing ourselves, trying to get a massive French colonial piano onto the stage. I shouted, We're not bloody well ready! Well, said the sweating sergeant, as you can hear, they are not quite bloody well ready. We're ready, but yet. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> won't be long now. And then, here, yeah, he put his head through the curtain. Hurry up, for Christ's sake. Keep at living, I said. You're a natural. He continued. Well, they're, uh, nearly, uh, not quite ready. <laughs> Soon we, really, not waiting for him to finish, we launched into our up tempo signature tune, The Boys from Battery D, which Harry Edgerton had written. We're the boys from Battery D, four boys from Battery D. We make a rhythmic noise, we give you dancing joys and sing the latest melody. Now we make the dance sound as we send you tracking on down. So if it's sweet or hot, we give it all we've got. Oh boy, we've got enough to go round. We set your feet, tapping with the quick step. We've a waltz that would make you sigh. And then the tempo we've got for a slow fox trot will make a wall fire wanna try. So come along, you, he and she. It's a dancer's jamboree. Come on and take a chance. Come on and have a dance to the band of Battery D. Not exactly Cole Porter, but we weren't getting his kind of money. To our amazement, we got an ovation. Three more jazz numbers and they wouldn't let us go. To cool them off, I got Doug Kidgel, our drummer, to sing to Sally's serenade. When he sang the line, Deep in my heart there is rapture. Forgetfully, we sang our customary version. Deep in my guts I've got rupture, but for that dear, I'd have of up cheer. We realised our mistake too late, and a great roar of laughter stopped the song in its tracks. We finished up with me impersonating Louis Armstrong doing the St. Louis blues and taking unending curtain calls. Old soldiers reading this, or listening to it, may remember that occasion. Driving back in the staff car, we sat silent in the aura of our unexpected success. To our left, the Bay of Algiers was bathed in moonlight. I never dreamed, said Harry, that one day I would be driven along the Bay of Algiers by moonlight. Didn't you, I said. The first time I saw you, I said, one day that man is going to be driven along the Bay of Algiers by moonlight. You're asking for a thud up the hooter, he said. No, I wasn't. What I said was, the first time I say, all right, Milligan, stick this in your dinner manglers, and he gave me a cigarette. Old sweats will shudder and fall faint when I mention the brand. V's. They had appeared in our rations when we landed in Algiers. This is, I said, living proof that British soldiers will smoke shit. And that goes from sanitary orderly, Geordie Little, up to General Alexander. Our files, our guitarist disagreed. 
Little, yes. He lives near it. He smokes it, yes, but I bet a bloke like General Alexander wouldn't wear it. There followed a classical argument on smoking shit that resolved in the agreement that General Alexander would smoke shit, provided it was offered to him by the king. The story went round that the V's cigarettes were India's contribution to the war. Churchill asked Gandhi if there was a, a natural commodity that was going to waste in India, and Gandhi said, yes, we've got plenty of cow shit. Right, said Churchill. We're sending you a million rupees to turn it into tobacco. Two years went by. Churchill, anchors for news, phones Gandhi. Churchill, Gandhi, how's the odds that's tobacco coming along? All right, but we need more money. Good God, man, you've had a million. Yes, you see, so far it looks like tobacco, it smokes like tobacco, but, but what? It still smells like shit.